right. So good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in from truly across the continent and beyond. My name is Jesse. I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know for many of you, this is your first time ever joining us, including our speakers today. So if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We've done 45 broadcasts live free since September 12th alone. It's been a crazy wild ride. Uh, if you guys want to check out all that we do, our YouTube channel has absolutely all of our programs. If you want to go back in time three years, you want to go back seven years, you can go check out our YouTube channel and see over 3,000 programs with amazing scientists and explorers the world over. Now, today I am particularly excited. One, because we've sorted out all sorts of tech hassles. As we all learned over the last three years, if something can go wrong in a video broadcast, sometimes it does. So we've made it work with Laura live uh, from the field. We're going to meet her in just a second, but you guys should be especially excited that we have made this all really exciting for you all. Secondly, and most importantly, when I was a boy, I was a tremendous nerd. I read every book I could. I got every DVD I could. If it was nature or science themed, I was there with like as quick as could be. The La Brea Tar Pits are one of the coolest places on planet Earth. I was like five. I was younger than half the kids joining us today. And this is one of the coolest places for fossil, or not fossil, for ancient animals in the world. And you guys get to go there today, both live in the field site and live in the lab. It is one of the most iconic sites on planet Earth. I'm so excited to finally bring it to our broadcast. So a big thank you to you all for skipping our space month. We've got all sorts of space programs going on. Skipping everything else you're doing. Skip math class to come hang out with us as we get to showcase some really amazing people doing some really top-notch work. I also have their website up, which I'll share with absolutely everyone throughout the broadcast, tarpits.org, to keep the learning going long after this is done. Now, first, we are going to head to Laura who had two devices, has handled with crazy tree trimming, all sorts of stuff to take us outside at the tar pits to learn about the amazing work that they do. So Laura, welcome to the broadcast and uh, tell us what you do as a senior fossil preparator and uh, more. Thank you so much, Jesse. And I just wanted to apologize. We are having some lag issues. We have tree trimming the park. We have construction of a museum next door to us. And we also have other guests in the park that are here in person, just like you guys are here virtually. So thank you all. But this is what happened. This is our real life. Um, not as much lag in real life, uh, but this is kind of what it is being an excavation site in the middle of the second largest city on the <laughs> continent. So uh, welcome to La Brea Tar Pits. Right now I'm outside in our Project 23 excavations. This is our current excavations where actually the same museum is doing construction next door, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art that shares the park with us. Back in 2006, dug underground next door, a couple hundred feet behind me, to dig an underground parking garage. And since the d animals didn't know not to die on that side of the park, uh, they found fossils when they were digging their underground parking garage. And they ended up finding so many, but our fossils tend to come in clumps, that what they were able to do was um, bring in a specialist working with the construction company, helping to look for the fossils, who then brought in different specialists who specialize in moving live trees by building boxes around the root balls. And they built boxes around the entire sections of earth. So all of that context of digging in the ground could be preserved as well as possible and moved over to our site. So we're digging in the ground, on the ground in a series of large wooden tree boxes. The smallest of them was about nine pounds. So like a Volkswagen bug size. And the largest was 123,000 pounds, like a small Victorian house in San Francisco. So there's a bit of range. And some of the fossils um, have different densities in different places. So some of the boxes only had hundreds or thousands of fossils. And yes, I'm spoiled because I said it had only hundreds or thousands of fossils. And that's because the box that I've been working on lately, which I'll get to in a second, um, very easily, I feel very comfortably stating just from seeing them as they go by, I haven't finished counting yet, but it has tens of thousands of fossils in it. And once the laboratory eventually every get through all of the lizard scales and mouse toes and insect legs and seed pods and freshwater snail shells. They come back and tell me there were over 100,000 fossils out of that one deposit alone. I won't be surprised. Again, I said we're spoiled. But so as we're excavating, we'll see the block in just a moment. But before I mess with my camera, just to make sure we get as much as possible, I brought over some of the dirt that just came out of that deposit. So if we're looking, we're seeing this is mostly Laura, so just a quick, quick note for you, Laura. We yeah. can hear you, but we can't actually see the dirt right now, unfortunately. So, oh, all right. I know. 
That's a we're we're trying okay. to get as good a connection from the field as possible. It was working just before we went live. But what we can do too is if you have pictures of this after the fact, we can make sure that all our classes do get we'll to see this. Explore and we're a little bit camp. better now. And just try to come over and visit the fossil block over here. Let's Perfect. see if I can. Oop. We'll just hold my camera around. And if I turn off that light, you can be my eyes, Jesse. Can we see yeah. those fossil blocks? Yeah, so it looks like just a bit, it's like a big pile so of, all of bone and dirt and everything together. Things. Yep, all jumbled. So we're looking at things. This one here is a tibiotarsis. So it's the lower leg of a, um, actually this one's probably an adult California turkey. It's a distinct kind of turkey. And then up here we have a golden eagle femur, so thigh bone. We've got some coyote metapodials, so foot bones from a coyote. And then all the way over here, we have lots of sticks. A lot of these are probably from California live oak and juniper. And I'm going to go ahead and bring it back over here. And we'll talk a little bit more about them. And I'll hold up some things that are a little bit bigger that we can see a little easier. Perfect. But I did want to mention um, that, oops, excuse me. Yep, that's me having my problems. Thank you so much. And no what we're doing over here is using mostly dental picks. So kind of slowly, carefully, grain by grain, digging through that sand. Because what we're actually digging in mathematically, we're famous for our asphalt, which is an important part of our story. We wouldn't have our fossils the way that they are without them. But the thing is, mathematically, what we're digging through is almost all sands. And it's uh, smaller sands in some areas, coarser sands in others. But mathematically, most of what we're digging through is sand. And that's also why I can use something like a dental pick, because rather than using the tip of it where I might accidentally scratch fossils, I can use it kind of more like a sculpting tool and kind of just slowly, carefully peel the dirt away. And that's how I uncover things. And so what I'll do is I'll slowly, carefully uncover until I start seeing enough shapes that I recognize. And uh, we're actually going to get to see a similar fossil to this with um, Ms. Stephanie in the lab. But this one, if you notice, it's about the size of my palm. This yeah. is a paw bone from an adult dire wolf. And dire wolves are actually our most common big animal that we have here at the La Brea Tar Pits. So it was easy for me to be like, oh, what are you talking about today? Oh, you ha I see a dire wolf by the field. I'll grab one too. Because uh, again, I'm very spoiled. We have lots of fossils and including a lot of the tiny things, which I'm sure Ms. Stephanie will share with us. And then I wanted to also bring out this larger fossil. And uh, so we can see that it has that classic La Brea brown color. Yeah. A lot of our fossils, well, actually most of our fossils have this color in different varieties. Because again, that asphalt that is so important to our story, that the reason that the sands look so black is also that asphalt gets into all the tiny little spaces inside the bones and actually absorbs into them and is what helps protect our fossils through tens of thousands of years. So even though they're still fossils, evidence of ancient life, um, and this particular one is probably about 42,000 years old, but it still has a lot of its original organic material. The bone is still chemically bone. It still has sometimes up to 80% of its original collagen. And because it's so young and so uh, well-preserved in that way, we can do things like carbon-14 dating and learn more about the exact time that a particular fossil came from. And we can also do things like stable isotope studies, which Ooh. is basically looking at the chemistry of things and seeing, all right, which carnivores, which meat eaters were eating which herbivores, which plant eaters, and then which plant eaters were eating which plants. And there's different little signatures that we can find in the chemistry because you are what you eat. And that's very mm -hmm. true. And just to understand what we're looking at here, so this one's a little bit different shape, but I have a copy of the bone right here. So this one is from an adult, this copy that's in my hand. This is a femur or a thigh bone from an adult saber tooth cat. But the way that I can tell, even though it has such a different shape, is that it's from the same animal, well, a lot of it's practice, but also you can see it's a very similar shape. But if you notice those end pieces are what looks so different. But when we're looking at this, it's not broken. It's just, that's where it ends. That's because this bone, like a lot of our viewers today, is what's known as a juvenile or not an adult yet. So just like most of our viewers, this still had room to grow. 
And just like most of our viewers, this is a mammal. And the way that mammals do that magic trick where we start out much smaller and get much taller, though I'm never gonna get any taller, I need to let that go, I'm an adult. <laughs> this doesn't work for me anymore. But with some of our younger audience members, you'll have growth plates, known as epiphyses, on either side of a lot of these big long bones, things like your thigh bone, your femur. And what this is, is that this then enables you to still have those end bones in place. They still do all of the work that they need to do, let your joints do all of the things that they need to do and be closer to adult sizes and shapes. But then you still have room to grow from this middle piece, this diaphysis. And it's after this finishes attaching that uh, you are considered an adult. So you have some time, but that's a good thing because you still need to grow. And just like this saber tooth cat did. And uh, not everything we're doing is using dental hooks. Sometimes in areas that don't have a lot of fossils, uh, you'll see us using things like hammers and a variety of chisels from very fine little ones to maybe slightly larger ones, all the way up to much larger because the entire blocks of earth that they preserved are not just the fossil concentration, it's also the dirt around it. And so we really want to make sure to uh, carefully go through all of that. And when I say that we go through all of that, so that dirt that we were talking about earlier, um, that also will get kept because we're talking about the larger fossils and those will get measured out specifically and go to the laboratory for more preparation, which definitely we'll talk about next. But all of that dirt that came out around it is organized by dirt that still has more fossils in it, usually tends to be sandier dirt, and dirt that doesn't, dirt that tends to be much fine sands, more silts and clays. But here, that type of sediment doesn't tend to have fossils in it. So we'll do samples just to make sure, but otherwise, as we go through, again, just this one deposit started out at 86,000 pounds. Um, it was about 10 feet, so about three meters in every direction. It was very large. So I really got to know the personality of the different sediments. And so at this point I can go through and be like, there's probably more fossils in there, there's probably not. So the dirt that still has more fossils in it will go to one of my coworkers in the back and put it through a series of chemical washes and screens. And that will help um, kind of reconstitute the asphalt a little bit, um, make it more liquidy again, and allow us to separate out the very fine sands, the silts and clays, and a bulk of the asphalt and then we can come in and record and pick out the biggest of the rocks and then what stephanie will mention later is that then we'll send instead of a five gallon bucket of dirt uh we'll end up with about a one gallon of just the concentrated matrix just matrix that really has fossils in it that is worth going through bit by bit but so we'll use a series of screens um that have holes in them to help us organize by size ranges and be able to kind of keep track of which types of fossils we're looking for in a particular area. But then all of those end up in these big batches. And so if we come over here, we can see there's much finer sands over here and much chunkier bits over here. Chunkier bits being the technical scientific term, not really, I just oh. talked about that. Um, but all the way up to big bones like this, that maybe when we were digging, it was covered with those asphaltic sands. Maybe this just looked like a rock, but just in case we kept it, which is good because this one's a little bit beat up um, just by the geology of the setting. Um, but at the same time, this is actually an ankle bone from an ancient bison. And the way that I can tell is that it has two of these little knobbies on the end, whereas a horse wouldn't, obviously. Um, these extra knobbies on the end, just fun fact while we're talking about uh, animals that live on land, uh, this shape shows up in all of its cousins, which is how we can tell they're related, which is also how we can tell that they're in the same line as whales, because when we look at really ancient fossil whales, they have these same kind of ankles. So it's not just me that's like, oh, those look really unique. Everybody noticed before me and is able to use things to figure things out. Whereas then we have smaller things like ankle bones from saber toothed cats, We've got pieces of shell from Western pond turtle. This is a Ooh. peripheral scoot. This looks like one of the little pie crimps on the edge of the turtle. Um, I've got things called dermal ossicles, little skin bones that I'm sure Stephanie will mention later. And then also sometimes things that are broken, like this little piece of coyote tooth that is broken. <laughs> and so I'll need Stephanie and her team to go through this bag and see if they can find the other piece of it and they can fix it. I just dug it up. They'll fix it. 
Um, mm -hmm. But you'd be surprised by how little in the grand scheme of things does actually get broken during this process. So we're very lucky in that our procedure works really well and protects things. Um, but I want to make sure that we have time to go ahead over to Stephanie. So thank you so much. Amazing. Well, really quick, Laura, first of all, yeah. thank you so, so much for such a cool tour. And I'm so glad the connection kicked into high gear and got working really well. A quick follow-up, because this is something that I think a lot of kids had trouble with. I had trouble with it when I was a boy. You talked about the fact that the bones you have are fundamentally real bone. And one of the main reasons that that's the case, as opposed to dinosaur fossils, is that they're a lot more recent. We're talking about these dire wolves and saber-toothed cats. They're how far back in the past are we talking for these creatures, as opposed to something like a T-Rex, which is 66 million years ago? Um, so these are only tens of thousands of years old instead of tens of millions, but I'm going to be difficult because life works that way. It's also because of the way they're preserved in the asphalt is yes. the reason that they are still chemically like that. Similar fossils were dug up down the street when they were building a subway station, uh, like the actual hole for the subway station itself. And they found our age fossils, our kinds of fossils species wise, but those ones, just so happened to the geology of the setting and the fact that the asphalt didn't happen to saturate those fossils, those fossils cool. are permineralized fossils Good where they fast. get chemically turned to stone. And that's usually because water moving through when it's buried will replace yep. the original minerals and replace it with other minerals. So that's how it gets chemically turned to stone. Whereas ours, oil and water, not so big on mixing. So the oil actually gets in there soon enough, then it gives it the chance uh, to actually preserve still as bone. But just to be difficult, even just in the Project 23 excavations we've been working on right now, we have some fossils that started to permineralize and then asphalt joined the party later. So we got like halvesy halvesies. So cool. everything is fantastic and complicated. It is. And uh, thank you so much for that. Not only uh, as a perfect answer, but also highlighting again why La Brea is such a unique and special place. Like, again, I love this spot. Uh, it's such a it's so special. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. I'm going to get my enthusiasm out the door here so that people can get to the real experts. So thank you so much, Laura. Stick around for Q&A and we'll head to Stephanie, our lab manager, to learn a little bit more from the indoor perspective. Stephanie, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much. And thank you, Laura, for that. And thank you, Jesse, and everyone for having me here. And today I'm going to share with you what we do in the lab. So as Laura indicated during her presentation, the next step after it's been excavated and processed outside is to bring it here in the lab. And we can do a lot more of the more detailed and refined work on removing all that surrounding sediment on the bones. And so this is just an example I can show you over here. So this is a metapodial. It's the toe bone. Can everyone see that, I hope, of a coyote. And you can see that it's still encrusted with quite a lot of this asphaltic matrix. And that is the term we use for all the sediment that has been uh, saturated with the asphalt that we have to remove. So our lab is very unique and different to other preparation labs in paleontology. Because of the asphalt, we cannot use uh, mechanical tools like zip scribes. We actually use chemicals in our lab and we use a chemical called Novex 73DE. And what it is, it's actually a degreasing solvent. It helps to break down the oil component inside the asphalt and then in turn helps us to liberate or remove uh, the sediment, the asphalt sediment around these bones. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration of how we do that, but safety first. So I've got to wear my gloves and I've got to put on my safety glasses. And these are a variety of the different kinds of tools that we can end up using here in the lab. So I am just going to put them out nicely so that you can see them. Oh, that toothbrush. And then I'm just going to use my hands to block it just so that you can all get a nice visual of it. You can see we have a wide variety of different tools here. We have toothbrushes, paintbrushes, Q-tips. We have toothpicks as well. And then we have these foam swabs that I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with now after COVID, that we've claimed it before COVID did. And so we like to use this, especially on fragile bone, because as it is used for testing, it's delicate fibers that won't cause any damage to your nasal passages. And it's the same idea with the fossil. It won't cause any damage to the fossil. And so what we would do is to get ready to do the preparation. We dip this into our solvent. And then I'm gonna do a live little demonstration here. Let me start so you can get as close to the camera as possible. And you will start seeing that brown bone becoming exposed as I do this preparation. I hope you can see that and then it's coming up clearly. 
But even if you can't see the bone becoming exposed, what you will notice is that the tool is starting to change color. And that is because the solvent is dissolving or liquefying that asphalt, and in turn, it's being absorbed by the foam. And so here, I hope you can get to see a little bit closer. Do you see how the brown color of the bone is yeah. starting to show up against the dark asphalt matrix? Moving. It looks fantastic, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> and so once we've finished the preparation of the specimen and we've removed all of that asphalt matrix, our specimen should look like this. So again, this is the toe bone or metapodial of a coyote. The coyotes we have here are Ice Age survivors, and that's why they're one of my favorite animals that we find here, because oftentimes people think we only have extinct animals here at the Tarpets, but we actually have a lot of uh, animals that we still find today, such as coyotes, raccoons, and weasels. Now, the other thing that we can get here in the lab is that sometimes the bones do not come to us as complete as this metapodial that I've just showed you. Here is another metapodial. This one belonged to a die wolf, but you'll see that it's broken in half. And I can show you, you can get a perfect fit on that. So we are able to rejoin these pieces. So we do a lot of this kind of conservation work here in the lab. We think of it like our arts and crafts station. Um, we use special adhesives called Paraloid B72. It's an archival adhesive, which means that it doesn't change over time. It's stable, it has a long shelf life, so it's very safe for the fossil and it will keep that repaired together forever, hopefully. And our paraloid comes to us in these little plastic beads. So our glue is actually a kind of plastic that we use and we dissolve these beads in acetone, the same acetone that is used to remove nail polish or clean um, paintbrushes and we can turn it into a liquid like this. And again, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see that it is in a quite a liquid consistency. And so the reason why we like to use this, apart from it being archival, is that it makes it fully reversible when we can dissolve something in a chemical that we want to be able to remove it. So if I've done a repair on a specimen and that repair is not 100%, or when I left it to dry overnight, that half slumped over, I can then take undiluted acetone and I can clean all that adhesive off and I can do that repair again without causing any damage to the fossil. And here is just the humerus or the upper arm bone of the direwolf. And I hope you can see all the bits and pieces that we have been able to glue together to make up this one bone. So these aren't just random bits and pieces that we grab anywhere. These are actually bits and pieces that were in the sediment surrounding this bone. And sometimes through taphonomic pressures or geological pressures, bones tend to shatter. So we can then get the bits and pieces associated with it. And you can see it's almost like 3D prehistoric puzzle building. They fit in quite nicely. We will glue them together. You can see a little bit of that excess adhesive over here, just the same as if you stick something on paper, there's sometimes that excess adhesive that oozes up. And again, we'll just use that acetone and we'll tidy it up nicely and then send it through to our collection scheme. But we do find challenges sometimes where we have bits of bone, but they don't fit together. Either the edges have been worn off or there is a significant part missing, but we know that they belong together, but they don't have that fit that allows them to stick. And that is when we use something called Kozo paper. So Kozo paper is an archival Japanese paper it's made from uh, mulberry fibers from the tree bark. And it's a really excellent material to use uh, when we want to use it like a fossil band-aid, if you like, to either replace missing bones or to give a connection that is weak additional strength. So you'll see that it has these frayed edges and we like it to have those fibers. We actually tear it to create these fibers because these fibers are great to adhering to the bone. So if ever you've walked through a spider web, it just feels like that spider web is everywhere. It is the same principle. Those frayed edges, those fibers will grab onto the bone and anchor. And then what we would do is we would place it over an area where we have the missing bone. We would drip some of our thin adhesive onto it. We let the adhesive run and spread, and then it ends up drying like this. I don't know if you can see where that crack is. And it's almost transparent. You can hardly see it. 
And again, the great thing about using um, that adhesive is if we ever need to remove it, when we find that missing piece, we just apply acetone onto it and we can remove that COSO paper and we can just peel it off and we can then put the missing piece of foam back in place. So that is everything that we do here in the lab when we are preparing these large fossils. But as we are preparing these large fossils and as we are removing this matrix that is surrounding this fossil, we have to look through that sediment as well because there might be tiny little fossils trapped inside that sediment. And so here's just a little vial. Uh, well, let me just get in there. I hope you can all see. This is a lot of the sediment. It's been processed to some extent where we no longer have a lot of that asphalt in it. That asphalt has been removed through washing it in the chemicals. And we will now pull this out under a microscope to see if we can find any missing uh, any um, microfossils. And we do that by sorting under the microscope with a paintbrush because the paintbrush bristles are very gentle and very soft and it helps us to separate the sediment from the fossil material. And I'm just gonna point to this screen over here so that you can just get an idea of what it is that we could potentially find. So over here, we have the lower jaw and teeth of a lizard. We have the cheek tooth of a pack rat or a wood rat over there. We have the leg of an insect, and then we have the backbone of a snake. And so I put the penny here for scale, just so that you can see how tiny they actually are. And you'll be able to see my paintbrush. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Again, if, if, oh, I might be blocking it to give scale. Sorry, I just need to find my place. Ah. There we go. Can you see it? Perfect. And then the, the Look one on the penny, just to give you a sense of how really tiny they are. So you can see that is the O on the one. And that is the comparison of size. And so these tiny little microfossils are extremely important to us because large animals like the dire wolf or the saber-toothed cat have large home ranges. So it means that they might just have been visiting this area when they got stuck in the asphalt and became part of the fossil record. But these smaller little animals called this place home. So we can actually look at these microfossils and they are able to tell us what the environment was like and what the climate was like so that we can get a better understanding of what the ancient environment here at the La Brea Tarpets in Los Angeles was like anywhere between 10,000 to 50,000 years. And so an interesting fact about our microfossils is that all the microfossil species that we find here in our fossil record are still living species that we can find today. And so that really helps us to understand exactly what environment that specific animal needs to be successful in. And if we find a lot of those animals represented here in the fossil record, we know that we needed to have a similar kind of climate and environment here to be able to support those large populations of those species. And so that helps us to be able to recreate past environments. And then it, it also helps us to understand maybe why these larger animals were attracted here. So maybe there was a lot of water around and things like that that they might have needed. And then to end off, people often say, well, how do you know that that is a snake vertebra? We have something that's called a comparative collection here in the lab. So it's almost like a, a bone library, if you like. And that gives us uh, every animal that we find here and their bones even if it's the modern ones, like I said, we find some modern animals here, and we can use this to help us identify and become, um, uh, uh, confirm what bone of what species we are looking at. So we use our comparative collection. So like I said, it's like a bone library and we can reference that. Um, and yes, as Laura was uh, pointing out, dermal ossicles earlier, so that's just one of these weird, crazy bones that we find here at the Tarpets, and it's actually one of my favorite. Dermal ossicles, so if any of you have ever gone to a dermatologist, that's a doctor for your skin. And osteo is a word for bone, so it's skin bone. And these are bones like this, tiny little nuggets of bones that work like chain link armor inside the sloth skin. So they were free floating embedded inside the skin of the sloth and they would work like an internal armor. So this over here is a photograph of a sloth skin, not from the tarpets. 
This is from a dry cave at a fossil site in Chile in South America. We have no soft uh, tissue preserved here at the Tarfoots. There's too much microbial activity in the asphalt, so it eats away all the soft tissue. So we have no skin and we have no fur here. But this was from a mummified cave in Chile, and it's the same group of sloths that we find here, the mylodon sloth. And if you look over here, you can see a little bit of the fur yeah. from the other side. And this is the inside of the skin. And all these white dots that you see are the dermal ossicles, these skin bones that are embedded in the sloth skin. And when are we talking about the sloth here? We're not talking about the same kind of sloth like living sloth today that we find in trees. We're talking about ground sloths. And these were large animals. And here is just a figure to give you an idea of what they look like. So this mm. is a, a ground sloth. And they were pretty large. They were a, at least uh, the size of a VW bug, if not bigger, uh, the vehicle. And so these were large animals that roamed this area. And maybe one of the reasons why they had this um, dimmel ossicles, this uh, armor of skin bones, is because if there were a pack of dire wolves or saber-toothed cats attacking them, they might have been put off by these big, knobbly, hard bits of bone in the skin and might have moved on to another prey victim instead of bothering the sloths. And yes, mm -hmm. that is what we do here in the lab. And that was just to show you some of the fun things we can find here in the lab. I've got to say, I've done 1,500 broadcasts, and that's the first time dermal ossicles have ever been brought up. So thank you for that. <laughs> in bones are just super weird. That's awesome. Uh, and I will say, crazy. okay, we, we talked about dire wolves, which are the most metal of all the wolves. We talked about Smilodon earlier with Laura. And then the ground sloths, okay, I'm a, I'm a sucker for predators, but ground sloths are my one exception. Like everybody should go and look up a ground sloth picture when you're done this to see how big those creatures are. The freakiest animals ever. I'll make sure I send a link to all our classes when we're done because they are just totally awesome. Oh, oh. I agree with you, JC, because, you know, when we think of a saber tooth cat, we can think of a lion. When we think of a dire wolf, we can think of a gray wolf. But there's nothing living today that we can compare with these ground sloths. They're awesome. Um, Stephanie, Laura, I'm just going to bring you back and say a quick hi as well. What we're going to do now is dive in with our Q&A. We've got a bunch coming on YouTube. And then, Miss Wafer, I'm coming to you guys first in just a second from our Laurel Spring School. Uh, but what I'll do is start with Stephanie. Um, put Laura in the background for now. We'll be back, we promise. Mr. Hancock wants to know, um, the strangest fossil you've ever seen, Stephanie, in your work in the lab? It must be the dermal articles. Uh, the first time I found them, I had no idea what I was looking at. I first thought it was a pebble, and then I recognized it was a bone, and I kept going through my mind, going through my bone database knowledge, thinking I have never seen anything like this in my life before. And then when I asked one of my colleagues, they said, oh, that's a dermal ossicle. It's a skin bone from the sloth. And I was like, whoa, mind blown. Yeah. Amazing. It's very rare that someone has the ready answer to a question that they just showed a second before. So thank you for that very much. Miss um, Wafer's class with students all around the world, Laurel Spring School. If you want to unmute your mic, you are good to go. Welcome in. Hey. Uh, hang on just a sec. Hang on just a sec. Uh, Take your time. I can always come back if you don't have one right now. I have one. It was just that I'm in a Zoom room and I tried to put my mic on both and it did not work. So the students are in a Zoom room. They are from Greece and Italy and the United States and uh, they're just super excited to be here. And the dire wolf and that little wolf in the background there has been a subject of uh, much discussion. And they noticed that that bone that I believe uh, your colleague was showing was seems small. So they wondered, Zoe is asking, she's in Greece and she's in seventh grade. Um, is What's the difference between the dire wolf size and like a gray wolf size? Because they thought the dire wolf bone looked a little small. So we wondered about that. Cool. Laura, if you want to field that one, you're good to go. Sure. So the dire wolf bone that I showed, just to make sure we're talking about the same bone, is a metapodial. This is a, a bone of the paw. And so keep in mind, it still has all the toes building down. So we're still looking at a paw that uh, basically some of the biggest timber wolves you'll see have paws about this size. They have very large paws. But the reason it looks so small is that it's just a bone. We have to imagine all of the, the muscles and fat and skin and fur that build on top of it to make this very large paw. But otherwise it does look small. And that's part of the challenge of our job sometimes is being able to take just the bones 
and be able to take our understanding of animals that live today and use it to try to figure out what these animals of the past look like as well. Perfect. I love that answer. The best example of this in terms of a fossil versus a living animal, look at an elephant fossil and how radically different an elephant fossil or bones look from what an actual elephant looks like. So it's always a bit of a guessing game and it makes it so exciting to be someone involved in the fossil world. So I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, Laura. Uh, we're gonna head to Miss Evans' class. Now you guys just have audio. So I'll bring you in if you wanna unmute your mic, you're good to go. And then I'll go to Stephanie or Laura, depending on what the question is. Hey guys. All right, All right. thank you. Um, so the question is, what is the most common fossil they find there or is it just a variety? Okay, Laura, I'm going to let you have this one. Stephanie, we'll come to you for the next one, okay? Come on back, Laura. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say that our most common large animals in order by number are dire wolf, saber-toothed cat, and coyote, just like the coyotes we have today, same species. But the reason I make sure to be careful to say the most common large animals is that once we get down to our small animals, we don't get that, that ratio shift of having way more meat eaters than plant eaters. And also we haven't finished counting all of the small things because again, there's the most common thing I've been digging up this week is actually a Silvalogus audubonii or desert cottontail rabbit. So rabbits are the most common thing I've been digging up this week. And it's fun fact, it's the same species that is actually living in the park. There's probably one underneath the structure that I'm standing on right now because yes. it's been living down there for the last couple of months. But so oh. rabbits are very, very common. And also birds are one of the like biggest categories of animals that we have. We're most famous for our big mammals, yep. but uh, just a reminder, there's a lot of rabbits and a lot of birds. For, for every large predator in the world, there's lots of things that predator has to eat. And so pretty much universally, no matter what the fossil site is in the world, we'll find a lot more of the little things and the herbivorous things than our big carnivores, as cool as they may be. Thank you for that, Laura, very much. Um, we're gonna head to Deep River, Mr. Shadow's class. Come on, five sixes, and take us away, and we'll head to Stephanie for our answer. Hey, guys. What's the biggest bone you found? Ooh, biggest bone we found, Stephanie. Anything you wanna tell us? So the biggest bone we have found here is that belonging to mammoths. So um, uh, I don't have it with me at the moment, but we have a mammoth toe in the lab that's probably about that big. And it's the tiny toe right at the tip of the foot. So um, again, like Laura was saying, if you have to build all those pieces together and it gives you the size, uh, that just gives you an idea. And if you will all bear with me, I don't want to give you motion sickness, but I'm going to turn the laptop a little bit because in the middle of the lab, we are currently working on a mammoth skull. So I'm just going to turn this a little bit so that you can see what we are doing in the lab. And do you see it is actually in that big jacket in the what? middle. And you can see Stevie, who is my colleague working in the background, and you can hey. actually use their body as scale. And that is <laughs> a mammoth skull that we are working on over there. So that is the biggest animal that we work on here in the lab. Very, very cool. Also, not the first scale body colleague wrangled into a broadcast, surprisingly enough. So thank you very much for that. Uh, very We're working cool. out great. I will note for our Mr. Shadows class, a lot of our classes are fairly near major museums. You can consistently find mastodon or mammoth fossils, teeth, heads in big museums. So if you want to see one of these in person, I really can't encourage it enough. They're quite magical. Um, speaking of uh, uh, sort of big places, Court ABC, we're going to head to Ms. Boland's class. If you guys want to come on in with a question, we'll field this with Stephanie as well, and we'll wrap up with Ms. Swanks, who's right after that. But come on in, BC guys. Hey. Hey, go ahead, Avery. Uh, how long does it take for the animal to decompose? Ooh, definitely. So that depends exactly, again, how big your animal is. But the decomposition rate in the tarpits is, is, is quite quick. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of microbial activity in the tarpits. So there are these little critters inside the asphalt that break down a lot of the soft tissue. And so they, they will munch on that and they will break it down quite quickly. And then what would happen is the skeleton would then uh, just separate from each other some, in most cases and end up in the tar. So, you know, probably I'm taking a guesstimate here, but probably like three to four months for a coyote to completely decompose in the asphalt. 
um, and that is if it's purely in the asphalt, but it could decompose quicker if there are uh, uh, animals at the top, sitting at the top, eating away at it like a bird or something like that. The fact that we have fossils at all, these ancient animals that sort of reveal ancient worlds is like black magic. Like, I, I think it's been estimated, I could be wrong about this, it's one in like 300 million bones or something. Like, if if the whole world of, of people in the United States right now were to pass away, we'd have one fossil person out of that. And that's I know. ridiculous to think about how many things have to die and in the exact right place and right conditions. It's what, make, it's what makes it a place like La Brea such a special location that we can find so many fossils because of the unique conditions there. Because if something just falls in a stream or falls on the ground, things eat it, bacteria break it down. We have no opportunity to know what that's like. And that's a call too to remember that most things that ever lived on earth, we don't know what they look like. We don't have fossils of them. There are so few ancient species we have compared to modern day species. And that's not the case. I mean, there were many, many more things back in the era of Smilodon, back in dinosaur eras, that we just have no clue about. And it's why it's so exciting to be in the steel because you're continually finding new creatures. It's the best science in the world. Don't tell the Absolutely. other ones. Yes. Um, and that's why we have the largest collection of Ice Age fossils anywhere in the world. Our collection is over three and a half million because the asphalt is like a sticky fly trap paper. Anything that gets into contact with it will get stuck in it. So we are really fortunate in the field of paleontology. You're just showing off now with that many millions of things. That's crazy. Um, I'm going to head to uh, Ms. Swangstu's class. Welcome in in Oregon, Ohio. Uh, if you guys want to wrap us up with one question, you are good to go. I wish we could take more, but I will share with all our classes more resources to keep the learning going. And we'll have Laura come in and answer this one. Uh, so, Laura, I'll welcome you back in first. And then Ms. Swangstu's class, come on in. Take us away. Okay, say it. What's the the most oldest no what's the most oldest fossil and the most complete yeah great question so if, I, if i heard the question correctly we're asking about the oldest and the most complete yes. uh, for oldest here at our site because we're mostly just looking at terrestrial or land-based animals so once you dig too deep at our site you start getting to the point where this was ocean um, only like maybe even as recent as 100,000 years ago. So the fossils that we're digging here that we can uh, use chemistry to understand how old they are with carbon-14 dating, those are mostly between about 15 and 50,000 years old. So the oldest that I have here are just around 50,000 years old. I have a couple things that are a little bit older, but then we start getting into the limit of where that chemistry can actually help us learn the age. But I know that they're gonna be less than 100,000 years ago because there's still animals that are walking around on the land. And so I know that there was land here. So that helps things. And most complete, it depends. They're pretty rare for us to get things more complete. We tend to get jumbles because of the streams that came down off the mountains near us that would help jumble things around and bury things quickly enough so that they get a chance to become a fossil. But uh, every once in a while we get into a, a fossil that was near enough to a stream but just has very, very fine things. So they just kind of took like a, a snapshot, just like a little Polaroid. And uh, we get to see things like insects that still have all the pieces of their body combined. We get things like, um, we have a fossil bird um, about a little songbird size from one of the other deposits that is still kind of like mostly curled up. It's still missing some of its pieces. Um, but we also have areas where we had a camel, uh, which yes, camels are, native to North America. I didn't know that until I worked here, so you're welcome. Um, but we had a camel where it was probably died near a stream channel. That's actually one of the ones I was mentioning that it started getting permineralized or chemically turned to stone and asphalt joined the party later. But we have uh, the skull and the jaw and the pieces of spine and then ribs and then um, one of its uh, humerus at the upper front leg as well. So we got a little snapshot of that and then asphalt came in to help preserve things. But so every once in a while, we find what we known as associated individuals or things that we can still yeah. track. But usually those are things that are very young, very rare, or have some kind of injury or disease that shows up on the bone so that we can tell them apart in all of that scramble. But it's very rare for us because we're spoiled mm -hmm. rotten. Very cool. Laura, thank you so much for this um, and for having the best backdrop of anyone ever in the history of our broadcast. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to bring Stephanie in a minute to answer the same question, and then we're going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. But is there any last message you want to share with us about the tar pits uh, that our kids can go home with today? I'm sorry I don't have dinosaurs, but I do have their grandkids' birds. Um, 
but it's just really nice that we get to be in the middle of such a big city and have the opportunity to share this story with so many people that this is their backyard that we're finding these fossils in. And so thank you again for giving us the opportunity to share it with all of you who this might not be your backyard. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Laura. Stephanie, anything to add from the fossil side of the lab? Well, just if ever you find yourself in LA, please stop by and say hi. We'd love to see you. I am en route. I'm going to book my plane right now into Ted from Newfoundland, Perfect. California. Um, Francis, thank you all so much for the great questions. Again, I'll make sure to send more links to keep the learning going. But Miss Wafer, Miss Evans, Mr. Shattuck, Miss Poland, Miss Swang's youth class, thank you all so, so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And thank bye you. Now, guys. Thank you, guys. Farewell, everyone. Oh, thank you so much, fun. Oh, yeah, live stream. Um, class, if you guys want to head off to the next period or just think about this for the next few hours, that's great. Too. 